You're listening to Psych with Mike. For more episodes or to connect with the show with comments, ideas, or to be a guest, go to www.psychwithmike.com. Follow the show on Twitter at Psych with Mike or like the Facebook page at Psych with Mike. Now, here's Psych with Mike. Welcome into the Psych with Mike Library. This is a somewhat congested Dr. Michael Mahan here with Mr. Brett Newcomb. Good morning. How are you? I'm good. I am uh, feeling a little out of my radio voice. (laughs) Well, but don't worry about it because you still have a face for radio. Well, that's very nice of you to say. (laughs) So I uh, had some interesting... Uh, revelations over the last couple of weeks, which you have been, let's uh, talk about the elephant in the room. You've been traveling, you've been in beautiful Mexico, and uh, that has been apparently, I, I assume, wonderful. Oh, it's always wonderful. Yeah. You know, tra- traveling to me is wonderful. I like to find new places and see new people and do new things. It's, uh, I might be an addiction. And I've been stuck here. <laughs> in the, I, I managed to be out of the country, or out of our area of the country, when there were two bad snow and ice storms. Yeah. And now that I've come home to cold weather, I don't like it. Mm-hmm. I may have to travel again. You may have to go back to Mexico. I don't know where I'll have. You'll have I to don't take know. up residence. Someplace warm. Somewhat random. Yeah. 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 Well, so while you were gone, I was actually doing some very uh, superficial research into uh, what is a successful podcast. Has anybody ever, you know, does anybody even know what a successful podcast is? And It's like art. I don't know what art is, but I know what I like. Well, yeah, yeah. and ours is absolutely the best clinically based show about psychology on the internet. That is the claim you make. That is the claim I make. And I... And since you're the research guy. Defy anybody to contest it. exactly. So, uh, if you... This is according to Libsyn, which is Liberated Syndication. That is the podcast hosting service that we use. It is the oldest and the first podcasting service, so their numbers are probably pretty accurate. And if you have more than 136 downloads uh, in a 30-day period from a release, then you are in the top 50% of podcasts. Hmm. So that actually means that between December and January, we actually got to the point where we are consistently getting 130 plus downloads uh, within a 30 day period for each episode. That's uh, gratifying to hear. I mean, it it puts us in, if we use the uh, yin and yang symbolism, it puts us in the little white S curve. Yes, Uh, that's right. Yeah. And what I'm aiming for is to be able to get into the top 20%. So I'm telling or, or, or tasking all of the so people. So tell your who friends listen, and neighbors. Tell all of your friends and neighbors. <laughs> so to get into that next level, yeah. so to get into the top 20%, you have to have 1,100 downloads per episode. So if everybody so just tells 10 people. That's that's right. Uh-huh. Now, I mean, I, I understand that that is, that is a, a, a heavy lift, uh-huh. but I actually believe that we've come a long way since we started this podcast. I think that the people that listen to it enjoy it. I think that it has information that would be very applicable to the population at large. So I think we can do that. And I'm I'm asking everybody to help us get to the point where we can do that. To get in the top 1%, you have to have 36,000 downloads per episode. Could they just send money? Uh... Yes, that would be. <laughs> but if, if you get into that top one percent, actually, uh, you get, are in a uh, uh, an area where you are getting monetized and you are actually making a considerable uh-huh. amount of money. And we're not going to talk about money. Um, that isn't our goal here. We're obviously not going to refuse it if it is offered. But uh, I really would love to get into that top twenty percent. That would be something that would be just well. Our goal when we phenomenal. set this up and started trying to do this was to provide a resource for both clients and clinicians on what we think is effective and good quality work for the process of therapy. Right. And and one of the strengths that we have, I think, uh, is that we may have different 
uh, attachments to intellectual theories. We may have different explanations that we offer logically, but both of us believe that the process of therapist, where the dance between the client and the therapist is a connected one and a safe one, that progress occurs and people get better. Right. So whatever, whatever you bring to the table as a, as a frame of reference, like I work from this per, a humanistic psychology per perspective, to me it doesn't really make a lot of difference. Mm -hmm. What makes the difference is what happens in the room. And if you can get in the room and mm -hmm. be still enough and be safe enough, then the process of that experience will help you heal and be stronger. And, you know, we're not a couple of journalists who got assigned to do the psychology story. We're not people who have had trauma histories that said, oh, I want to go talk about that. Not that there's anything wrong with that. That's perfectly fine. But I mean, we are educated and trained professionals who raised our children, paid our mortgages, doing psychotherapy all of our lives. We are university professors who have taught other people how to be trained clinicians. And I think that that makes this show different and I, I mean I'm going to say it better than anybody else who's talking about oh here go and do this self-help thing well let's do some of that yeah so uh, we are talking about becoming successful, right. but you and I have always said that we don't believe that people have a fear of failure in society. We believe that the real issue is a fear of success. Yeah, I, I think people have a script of failure or fear of failure that they've been, uh, it's been inculcated in them through their education and experiences. People say, well, you're not smart enough to do that or you don't, you, you can't do that, whatever that might be. And so, if, you know, I want to start a business and all my friends or relatives say, you don't know anything about business. You've never had a business. You don't know what's involved in a business. And so you can't be a successful businessman. Most businesses fail. Mm -hmm. And so you question yourself and you say, well, uh, probably, probably they're right. Probably I'm wrong. But, you know, if, if the drive is strong enough to say, I want to try this, then you put yourself into it. And then it doesn't work. And you say, well, they were right. Mm -hmm. But our conversation... It confirms the worldview. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so our conversation has always been, is there an element of self-sabotage? Are they doing something or not doing something that they should be doing that would enhance their success? And so the, the background that I come from is one of being raised in a violent alcoholic family. I'm an adult child of an alcoholic, which used to be a common phrase that you heard in therapy circles all the time and one of the things that I learned early in life is you never let anybody know what you want mm -hmm. you know even if it's I want to stop for ice cream mm -hmm. because if they know they can use they it. can hurt you with it they can control you and manipulate you and put you up and down a, an emotional ladder that's horrible and so you you teach yourself not to let anybody else know but in the process of doing that you often learn not to know your own self mm. what do I want what will make me happy what will give me satisfaction mm -hmm. or freedom or independence or what, whatever the that's a really excellent point I had actually never actually thought of it that way but because you spend so much time trying to hide that from the rest right. of the world you may actually learn how to hide it from yourself when you get to be an adult you may not know right what you want yeah mm -hmm. yeah and yeah. so so people offer you shiny objects and you think oh that looks good mm -hmm. or they tell you you'll be really good at this after a lifetime of hearing you won't be good at something so it's easy to allow yourself to get seduced into a pathway or a dream that maybe you didn't choose. Mm -hmm. And so even if you are successful to a degree, at some point you'll start to self-sabotage because uh, it's like you can't fire me, I quit. Mm -hmm. You can't hurt me with failure because I'm just going to stop. I would never want to be a member of a group that would accept me as yeah. a member. Well, Groucho Marx, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So for me, I've always used this metaphor of climbing a ladder. Uh -huh. And if you say that the ladder is success and you climb up to the top of the ladder and you fall off, you're going to get hurt. Right. If you climb two rungs and you fall off, you're, you're fine. Yeah. And I've always thought of it that way, that, that people are willing to climb a couple of rungs, but 
then they get scared because they start thinking to themselves, well, if I keep climbing this ladder and I fall off, right. then the consequences are going to be much more severe. So it's easier to fail early rather than to try and work towards success and actually achieve it because there is this preconceived idea that I'm not going to be able to really pull it off anyway. I think you're right. And I think, you know, we allow ourselves then to become two rung or three rung climbers. Mm -hmm. And then we find a reason to stop climbing. Either we project that onto somebody else's behavior or decision making. Well, they they screwed it up, so I can't be successful. Or we do it ourselves, but deny that we did it. Uh, for and yet you, you you read and hear that lots of media publish these things about uh, people have multiple failures and keep mm -hmm. trying and mm -hmm. finally have a huge success. Uh, the, the stories and I don't remember the numbers. I'm stalling. Uh, Michael Jordan. Yeah. Asked for the last shot in the game yeah. 50,000 times, made it 12,000 times, mm -hmm. and, and was the best ever in basketball. But what they're not focusing on is that he didn't make the shot 40 something thousand right. times. Right. So he failed 10, and 10, 20, 30 times more than he succeeded. In baseball, yeah. if you have a 333 batting average, yeah. you are the three. best in the league, yeah. but you're only hitting the ball one third of the time. Right. So that's so true yeah. is that we don't really think about how much failure goes into success. success. Yeah. And, and we don't allow ourselves to believe that it's okay to experience failure. And, and we've talked about this ad nauseum, we don't allow our children to experience failure as a way of learning how to be able to right their own ship. And so we train ourselves to not be comfortable with the concept of failure from a very young age, even though we then tell everybody, well, you're going to fail. So what we really are doing is training ourselves not to try. Well, you internalize a script, it becomes a self fulfilling prophecy. And especially if you're raised by critical parents who continue to say, See, I told you you'd screw mm -hmm. that up. You can't do that. Don't try that. You're doing that wrong. Even if it's mopping the floor, you do that wrong. Now I'm going to have to punish you because you failed. Right. You have to do it again, do it again, do it again. I, I remember when I was in college, I, I worked, I was married, I worked full time at a grocery store, and then I went to school full time. And the manager of the grocery store was a high school dropout. And we lived in a college town, and he had relatives that hired him to manage this grocery store. Mm -hmm. And I guess he was pretty adequate about that. But he didn't like college students. Right. And I worked. Uppity yeah, college students. Absolutely. Ones that were, let him know in some way next year I'll that he was this inferior. Job. You, yeah. yeah. Uh, which perhaps I was self sabotaging by letting him know that's how I felt. But I worked from like six in the morning on a Saturday to 10 at night when the store closed. And then I would be the one that would be tapped to stay behind and mop the floor mm -hmm. of the entire store. And I'd mop it and I'd be ready to go home and I'd work a 12 or 14 hour day and I was physically exhausted. And he'd come wandering through and say, this isn't good. Mop it again. You know, and do that a couple times. And I couldn't afford to quit because I had mm -hmm. a wife and, and I had bills and obligations. And, you know, and so you internalize those expectations. You internalize those scripts. And you find ways then to get yourself fired mm -hmm. so that you, I mean, you don't quit. You don't say, you know what, I don't have to put up with this crap. I'm going to go find a different right. job. You stay with the job where you're getting abused and you get fired and then you say, this always happens to me. I'm really not good at this. Right. Um, Which is exactly why I actually thought about talking about this subject in the first place is um, there'll be a slide up right now that'll show the dopamine pathways okay. in the brain so you can see that right and, and dope is a drug not, yeah not dope is dopamine a, yeah. is a neurotransmitter yeah. and it's actually a neurotransmitter that is associated with addiction and it operates in the frontal lobe of the frontal cortex of the brain right. and runs through the uh, an area called the nucleus accumbens and it creates the reward pathway that makes you feel good about things and one of the articles that we were reading about this when we got ready to do research on this subject said that we get a reinforcement of dopamine when we avoid something that feels hard the same as we do when we succeed at something that, that we want to do yeah yeah and all 
all of a sudden that was like a light bulb for me. I was like, oh, that's why people avoid things. And we say, well, why do you avoid it when you when you say you want this thing, but then you do all of this stuff that gets in the way because your brain's actually rewarding you through the avoidance but in the of, same way it would if you actually succeeded. It's part of the pre-verbal learning process. Mm-hmm. You know, you're not thinking your way through it. I mean, think about teaching a child not to touch a hot stove. You know, and and they don't know the concept of hot stove and they don't necessarily control all their muscles and you worry about them bumping against something and getting burned or what have you and so you warn them and you warn them and you warn them and then if they you know manage to navigate the space without touching the hot thing you praise them and give them a stroke they start to internalize that but when they actually touch the stove I mean it can be one trial learning mm-hmm. and, and they burn and they pull their hand away and I and used to say to patients all the time clients all the time if you got your hand on the stove, stove and you're crying because it's hot, take your damn hand off. Right. And if you learn to do that, then when you have the urge to test is the stove hot, is the coffee pot hot, whatever, and you don't do it, you get that little dopamine flush of you've mm-hmm. learned well. This has been a good thing for you, and here, here's your reward. And and so then I think that process happens throughout our lifetime. And then. For me, thinking in that way that, okay, you're going to get a reward in your brain for avoidance, the same as success, the real work is in choosing the reward that you want. Do you want the small, easy reward of, okay, I can quit and avoid and I'll get a little shot of dopamine, or do you want the good reward, the, the larger reward of, okay, I did this thing and I finished it and I feel good about it because with the larger reward comes, we've talked about this in the past, this idea of self-confidence, which boosts your self-esteem. You're going to overall increase the perception of self by engaging in behaviors that are successful. You're going to get a greater reward, but it's going to take longer and it's going to take more effort. And you have to make that conscious decision. So how much of that is uh, is the uh, Pavlovian classical conditioning uh, where uh, you remember the experiment about the there are two different ones I'm thinking about. One is the executive monkey experiment where they suspended two monkeys in front of buttons mm-hmm. and one monkey was the executive monkey mm-hmm. and his button worked. Mm-hmm. And every five or ten seconds they'd get an electrical shock and they would reach out and push the button and turn the shock off. And the monkey whose buttons didn't work learned helplessness because right. his buttons didn't work. So whatever mm-hmm. happened in his life just happened to him. And then he would he would shrink down mm-hmm. and huddle and sit there and life would just happen to him. But the executive monkey learned I can I learned to tell time. Mm-hmm. I can hit this mm-hmm. at exactly the right time and avoid the shock. Mm-hmm. But then he would develop anxieties and ulcers and, and stuff from the responsibility of always having to be alert and hyper vigilant and aware. Right. So if you talk about that, that is a classical conditioning thing where it's a stimulus reward right. response right. punishment kind of yeah. thing. Um, and, and then the uh, the other one that I was thinking about, uh, we I remember talking to you before about a, a study that was done where they wired an electrode into the sexual gratification spot of a monkey's brain wired it to a button and he had two buttons one would drop a food pellet in that he could eat Mm -hmm. and one would give him a surge of sexual satisfaction Mm -hmm. and he starved to death yeah but boy was he he was sexually satisfied all the way long yeah you know and and so your point about can you choose your reward Mm -hmm. spectrum uh, with, with a cognitive process, or do you just reflexively choose it? And I, I think that's part of what therapy offers is an opportunity to step back and say, okay, here's the pattern. Can you think about that, and can you choose a different way or a different mm-hmm. reward and attach yourself to that? Or is that so entrenched that that's your destiny? Well, so what I would, if that's an actual question, what I the answer for me would be that if you don't consciously choose it, right. then your unconscious will choose it for you. I have said that to my clients over and over for years. As long as you are cognitively right. 
framing and, and processing your experience, you can choose the path. Yeah. But if you go on autopilot, your unconscious, your history, your trauma history, whatever it is, will choose the path. That's right. And, and so you keep repeating. And, and, and so let's, um, let's use a real world, world example like, okay, I want to lose 10 pounds. Right. So if I want to lose 10 pounds, but mm, I love ice cream, <laughs> then you're yeah. always in this perpetual battle with, I would like to lose 10 pounds, but then I have this quick reward of eating ice cream and feeling good about having to having eaten the ice cream. So how do you stay on track? We weren't supposed to talk about personal stories. Well, everything's (laughs) personal, right? But yeah. you, so, so you have to find ways of being able to stay focused on trying to lose the 10 pounds, whether it is a picture of an outfit that you would like to get into or a destination that you would like to travel to, but you would like to lose the weight first. Right. And then you have to say, I'm going to choose not to eat the ice cream right. because I have this larger goal of being able to lose 10 pounds so that I can go to this destination. Right. And then when you're faced with, oh, but you know, I've, I've had a bad day at work and God, I would really like to go home and eat the ice cream. Right. That's when it's important. It's, it, it's important to, or, or that's when you have to do it, but it's not important to keep that in your mind when you've had the bad day. It's important to keep it in your mind all the other times. Right. Your brain, once you habituate it, right. your brain's going to go to whatever has been habituated. Right. Right. So this is what people do is they say, oh, you know, I, I kept the picture of, you know, Jamaica on on my computer right. and when I looked at it I felt really good but it wasn't around when I really needed it no you've got to keep it in your mind all the time when you don't need it so that it will pop up you can also train yourself to uh, do thought stopping mm-hmm. or, or do replacement thoughts uh, you can teach yourself for example continuing the, the analogy when I crave ice cream, drop down and do 20 push-ups. Mm-hmm. Every time I want ice cream, do 20 push-ups. And yep. eventually, those ice cream craving. If you want to stop doing push-ups, you'll <laughs> stop craving ice cream. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. But you have to do it all the time. Right. I mean, and, and consistency, we say this over and over consistently. Consistency right. is the key. Yeah. And it is the key with training your brain. It's the key with being a parent. It's the key with success. Well, consistency that's framed by the belief that you can change, that you can make a difference. Well, here's what I would say, though. Your unconscious is going to be consistent, right? Whether you are or not, yeah. And so, consistency is still always the key, whether you consciously are choosing it or your unconscious is choosing so it for then you, you. Then you have to learn reality testing. Mm. Uh, how's this working for you? you know, the classic therapeutic question: How's that working for mm-hmm. you? You know, I don't, I don't want to drink anymore, but I just bought a bottle right. of scotch. Somebody right. gave me a bottle of scotch, right. so you know, it'd be rude to refuse that or not open it or not consume it. I don't want to pour it down the drain; it's expensive. You know, so maybe I'll just take a little sip of this until it's gone, then I won't buy any more. Mm-hmm. Uh, you just find ways to sabotage right. yourself, right? And you have to continually be on guard so that you don't give in right. to those times when the unconscious is speaking to you and saying this would be easier and you'll get a reward for it yeah so hopefully that was a beneficial conversation for people as always the music that appears in psych with mike is written and performed by mr benjamin de you can always get a hold of us at psychwithmike.com and remember tell 10 friends so that we can move psych with mike up into the next level get up into the 20 percent of podcast success we're really aiming for success yes thank All you right. for listening if it's friday it's psych with mike